Welcome, one and all. Now, it's been a while since I did one of these, really, so it's about time we started again. Yes, this is another revision video, and as I'm now in year 13, we're now doing stuff from the A2 side of the syllabus. And today we're going to be doing a bit of biology, so it's the A2 syllabus of AQA biology. Now, what are we going to be doing? Well, it's about photosynthesis. I could go outside, there's no leaves on the trees at the moment, so what better place to do this video in is next to a Christmas tree. I know, brilliant. Right, okay. Now, the photosynthesis part of Unit 4 is probably the trickiest bit in it, especially if you don't do chemistry. A lot of the stuff in here, you can sort of link to chemistry, so I do A-level chemistry, so I guess I've kind of grasped it a bit quicker, maybe? I don't know. So that means, well, that's good, because that means I can explain to you. Um, now, my last revision video, I think you remember, was on plants. So this is sort of completing the puzzle piece, if you like. Now, what is photosynthesis? Well, photosynthesis, you've probably all heard of it, and you probably thought of it as a sort of one-step reaction. Well, obviously, in A2 biology, that's not the case. It is a, well, it's two main reactions, but it's a whole bunch of different processes. This Christmas tree isn't probably doing, not doing a lot of photosynthesis at the moment, but we'll pretend it is. Now, we have leaves, right? I showed you a leaf in the last video. That was brilliant, wasn't it? Um, and they, each leaf cell, there's loads of things different between a plant cell and an animal cell. Some of the differences are, well, a plant cell has a large vacuole in its centre, which stores cell sap. Um... A plant cell has a cell wall, which animal cells don't. The thing where the party is really at in today's video is in the chloroplasts. These organelles inside the plant cell, and they contain the pigment chloro chlorophyll, which initiates photosynthesis. And all the photosynthesis occurs in these chloroplasts. Now, chloroplasts, there are two main parts to a chloroplast. There's the grana, which consists of heaps of discs. They're like um, little CDs packed up on top of each other. When you see them in the diagram, you get to get that idea. Um, and they're called thylakoids. Thylakoids stacked up on top of each other. That's where the first part of photosynthesis takes place, called the light-dependent reaction. And you also have the stroma. That's the liquid, gooey stuff all around the grana. And that's where the light-independent reaction takes place. I feel like drawing on this whiteboard. So, well, well, that wasn't a good idea, was it? They're like the disc-like structures. If you go to your textbook, there's a much better diagram. But anyway, so they carry out photosynthesis, and the plant cell is very well adapted to increase the rate of photosynthesis as much as possible. The chloroplasts have a large membrane. That means enzymes, there's a large surface area for enzymes to attach, so more photosynthesis can take place. A lot of elements from AS are coming in here. Okay, so that's sort of a brief overview on why chloroplast is useful, why it's good. Another good thing about it is that it actually contains its own DNA and ribosomes, so therefore it can manufacture proteins such as enzymes which are needed for photosynthesis very, very quickly. So that's better if they, it was just relying on the nucleus. So, First stage is the light dependent reaction. Now, the light dependent reaction depends on light. And we're going to start the story right from the beginning. Right. We have a chlorophyll molecule. What's inside the chlorophyll? We have chlorophyll. There's going to be loads and loads of chlorophyll molecules in a single chloroplast. So, think about this. We're just talking about one chlorophyll molecule out of many. Think about how many there are in a chloroplast and how many there are in a whole leaf. Quite a lot. So this reaction is going on a lot, is what I'm trying to say. Now, we have a chlorophyll molecule. The sun's shining, it's winter now, so it probably won't happen as much. Well, the leaves all off the trees anyway. So, light will fall on this chlorophyll molecule. Now, this is where actually a bit of physics knowledge comes in. Whilst the light hits the chlorophyll molecule, it excites electrons. If I draw 
a typical atom with its electron. So that's that's a lithium atom, right? So that is obviously isn't going to be involved in the portal. Now, if I give one of these electrons enough energy, it can jump from this cell, from this shell, to the next one. That means we call this an excited state because it's moving from this energy level, they're called energy levels as well, to this energy level, a higher energy level. And that's exactly what the electrons are doing inside these chlorophyll molecules. They're moving to higher energy levels. The thing is, they get these electrons get so much energy that they actually leave the chlorophyll molecule completely. And they move along a series of electron carriers. I don't know how I'm going to... That's an electron carrier. And these electron carriers are proteins. Now, as these electrons move along this series of electron carriers, they lose more and more energy. Where does that energy go? Well, actually, that's not a bad thing, because the energy lost as the electrons lose their energy as they travel along is used to combine ADP with an inorganic phosphate. They're just wandering around, having a good time. And that will create ATP, which is very useful. Well, actually, it's not going to be used. It's going to be used later in the light-independent reaction, but we'll go on to that in a second. Now, electrons have left this chlorophyll molecule. That means it's charged, because, well, electrons have left it. You've left it with a positive charge. Now, this chlorophyll won't work anymore unless those electrons that have been lost are replaced. So where do those electrons come from? Well, they all come from water. It's not just a chlorophyll molecule which is affected by light here, it's by a water molecule. A water molecule, light will hit a water molecule and split it up. It's called photolysis. And it'll split it up. Hang on. I'm going to show you the chemical equation here. Two water molecules will split up into four hydrogen ions. A hydrogen ion could also be called a proton because it doesn't have any neutrons. A hydrogen ion. Four electrons. And two oxygens. Actually, that could be all simplified down much more easily. Like that, couldn't it? Yeah? So, we've got two protons produced, two electrons produced, and an oxygen molecule produced for every molecule of, of water. These electrons will move to the chlorophyll molecule, replacing those that are lost. The oxygen will diffuse out of the cell and out of the plant, so into the atmosphere. That's something we've got to be particularly grateful of because that's the oxygen we're breathing at the moment. Very useful. These protons are not going to take that path. They're going to get absorbed by another molecule called NADP. And that is, it doesn't say this in the book, but I'm presuming these electrons also meet here as well. So we're going along the electron carriers. Now, Something we need to understand here is redox reactions. What's a redox reaction? Or, put it simply, reduction or oxidation. Oxidation is when something gains oxygen. That sounds simple enough, but there's the more common definition for it is when something gains or something loses electrons or loses hydrogen. You can remember it using this very clever thing, oil rig, right? Oxidation is loss of electrons. Reduction, however, is either losing oxygen or gaining electrons or gaining hydrogen. So, 
reduction is gain. So if there was a question in the exam, I'd be more tempted to say oxidation is the loss of electrons or hydrogens and reduction is the gain of electrons and hydrogens rather than saying oxygen. Although, of course, you could put that as well. Just remember it's the other way around. Um, so, yeah. So as we have got hydrogen ions getting absorbed by this NADP, it is therefore getting reduced. So we call it reduced NADP or NADPH. Now, this NADPH is not just there, you know, to have a laugh. It's going to go into the light independent reaction. Now, we can see why this is called the light dependent reaction, because it relies on light. We've got light hitting um, a chlorophyll molecule here, which stimulates this whole malarkey off. Crack it, just drawn on the pleasure. Anyway, <laughs> now, it's a light independent reaction now, so this doesn't rely on light, technically, but technically speaking, it does, because it relies on the products from the light dependent reaction, which need light. So if there wasn't any light, this thing couldn't really go on for much longer. But anyway, it's called the light independent reaction. So anyway, right. So, what happens? So, we've got CO2 diffusing into the leaf cell along the, through the stomatal pores, which we talked about in another revision video, I think you remember. Um, and it reaches the stroma. Remember, the light independent reaction is taking place in the stroma. And it combines with a molecule called ribulose bisphosphate, right? Also known as RUBP. And it does that using an enzyme. Now, when these two combine, you get G3P, or glycerate 3 phosphate. But if you just wrote G3P in the exam, that would be quite all right, I would think. I don't know, really. But anyway. So, yeah, so you've got G3P. Now, this is where our good old NEDP and the ATP produced from the light-dependent reaction comes in. Because this needs to get reduced. So, this ATP helps the NADP release all those hydrogens again, and those electrons. So that will split off again into ADP and a phosphate. So there's no net gain of ATP here. That's when respiration occurs, which I'll probably do in another video. Let's be honest. Um, so, and then you've got NADPH here, releasing those hydrogens and electrons back, so it's not reduced anymore. It is, in fact, getting oxidised, isn't it? Because it's losing electrons and losing hydrogen. That goes on to form TP. What does TP stand for? Triosphosphate. Now, triosphosphate can go two ways now. Triosphosphate can go either back into RUBP, or it can go on to make sugars, namely glucose, right? And the chances of this happening is about one in six. So therefore, theoretically, remember this equation, six CO2 plus six H2O goes to C6 H2O. 12.06.6.02. That is the chemical equation for photosynthesis, right? So what that's saying is, you need six cycles of this, because you can see it is a cycle. In fact, I should have mentioned this, it's called the Calvin cycle. Right? It's either called the light independent reaction or the Calvin cycle. Two names for it there. Um, so, if if one in six times glucose is produced, to get glucose, this cycle and the light dependent reaction need to happen six times, which is why we've got the sixes here to create one molecule of glucose. That is pretty much it. It's basically all reduction. 
something I should say here, the enzyme for IUBP and CO2 is called Rubisco. Um, and that's basically it. It's basically, if you get to understand redox, I don't think it's that bad. It's just a process you've got to get to know, I suppose. So that's about it. I hope that was useful. It took a bit longer than I expected, but hey-ho. Um, now, shout out to Ed, Aubrey, Will, Marcus, Suzanne, and Katie. Biology class, whoop, whoop. Um, of course, Will, and, uh, yeah, Will and Katie actually were in the last revision video, which we did with the class, which was brilliant. Well done for that. I never said that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Will, for the sombrero. Thank you for all the, you know, all the other fan presents that I've been getting. Yeah, unfortunately, we can't show them all on the program. But anyway, thank you very much. See you very soon. Bye.